a lot of the deep learning is modeled on the human brain. So if you think of deep learning is the same types of circuitry as the human brain, because we only emulate what we know, right? It's really hard to design something if you are, if you don't have that understanding. So in a way we're creating systems in the image of us. And I think where the technology is gonna go next um, from really thinking of the healthcare and human services is really trying to understand the human condition welcome back to the data bites podcast everyone i am joined with a very impressive guest as i was perusing through her bio she has extensive work in not only leadership as a chief information officer currently at the jewish board of family and children's services and previously the Chief Data and Analytics Officer of the State of Texas, Department of Family and Protective Services, um, but also has a PhD in Health Services from New York University, is currently a faculty and a constructor there, and just has done really, really incredible things. So Bessa, welcome to the Data Bytes Podcast. I'm so excited to be chatting with you here today. Same here. Pleasure being here, Sadie, and thank you for the opportunity to have a conversation. Yes, I was so interested in your background and your work because you have combined two really interesting intersections, one of health and social services, but also the amazing technology of data and AI. How did that come to be? Where did this love of both, really, I feel like humanity and healthcare mm -hmm. and people, but also what is often classified on the opposite end, which is technology and data and systems. How how did that combination of the two together come to be for you? I think for me, I had the sort of the ambidextrous kind of left hand, right hand, left hemisphere, right hemisphere. I think for me, both hemispheres were fired. Um, so I've always had an interest in the heart sciences, so technology, math and science, and I found that fascinating. But I, I was also interested in sort of the human condition and kind of trying to understand people and how do you apply you know these hard science problems to the soft sciences in a lot of way because you have a separation and the dualism between hard sciences and soft sciences so I've always straddled the two sides of the universe I was always interested in human problems by solving them with technology and I see that I mean it, it was convergent then now it's becoming much more um uh, there's much more convergence now. I think in the past it was very divergent where, you know, it was very different with, you know, hard sciences and soft sciences. And we're seeing that that's much becoming much more integrated. And the way that I started my career was as a biomedical engineer, I was really good at math. So obviously when you're good at math, your advisors are kind of pushing you towards, you know, your strengths. And my strengths were always, you know, the math, science, the STEM uh, areas and some of the, you know, grappling questions there. But, you know, over time, I got interested more in the human condition, kind of understanding the inner life of individuals, but also understanding how individuals function within their environments and how that affects health and well-being. And technology was always at the background, along with the hard sciences, kind of, you know, keeping me going, keeping that part of my brain engaged. So I've kind of had the opportunity for my career kind of be more interdisciplinary and combine those two areas over time. Amazing. So you have seen how AI has already transformed the landscape of healthcare, but I'm also sure have ideas of how it's going to continue to transform this landscape. Can you talk a little bit more about what you've seen happen in the world of healthcare and human services and what you hope technology infuses into this space as well? Those are really great questions. Um, I think a lot of these, what we call AI, have been around for over 50 years. I was giving a lecture recently to uh, a few graduate students. As far as, you know, like the genesis of a lot of this has been ongoing for a long time. The reason that it's coming to uh, the forefront now is really with a lot of the latest, you know, applications that are becoming common to the common man, right? Before it was a purview of academia, purview of the few, um, primarily a lot of development where they technology companies or, you know, 
know, institutions of higher learning, where a lot of these systems were being designed and tested more in a theoretical perspective, but didn't have that application transfer. So what we're seeing, especially with ChatGPT and a few of the other launches, so the, you know, the conversational applications have come and matured over time. So we're able to converse very differently than we were in the past. I think in the, I remember when I had to program little things and little algorithms to do like one or two tasks. Um, but I think now with a lot of the um, development in the field that we're seeing the sophistication, number one, but also emergent properties of those technologies we were not originally designed for, which I think is interesting. And a lot of these emerging properties are going to be very important for healthcare and human services and how we interact with the human machine types of systems. And what we're seeing as in the past decade and a half is really the emergence of um, neuromorphic hardware. Um, a lot of the deep learning is modeled on the human brain. So if you think of deep learning is the same types of circuitry as the human brain, because we only emulate what we know, right? It's really hard to design something if you are, if you don't have that understanding. So in a way, we're creating systems in the image of us. And I think where the technology is going to go next um, from really thinking of the healthcare and human services is really trying to understand the human condition, but understanding the human condition from a system that we created, a technological system that we created, and in a way, including that system into the feedback loop, either of care, of treatment, or providing psychotherapeutic support, or any other types of approaches. So I think and, and a lot of work has been done already. Um, there is a professor at MIT uh, Media Lab, Dr. Picard, um, and there's two companies that spun out out of that. Um, one is Empatica, and I can't remember the other one. But the whole idea of actually teaching machines to understand human emotion, understand micro expressions, and come up with appropriate responses. I think it's fascinating. So we're going to have uh, fine tuning of these applications where they're able to look at facial recognition, they're able to look at movements and respond back accordingly or approximately accordingly to what would be uh, if a human does the same thing. I want to dive back just a little bit to what you first said, which is, you know, we're modeling these systems after our brain because that's something we know, or at least know a little bit about, right? We don't know everything about the brain, but we yeah. know a good chunk. And it kind of, it reminds me of the saying, like, you can't be what you can't see. Maybe, you know, we can't create yeah. what we haven't seen before. Yeah. And I like how you broke down we've replicated some of like the intelligence, I think of like high school exams and college exams, right? These systems do well, but we're missing out a little bit on like the common sense of these systems, or as you so rightfully mentioned, the emotion. How do you think we're going to be able to model that in an artificial system? Like, is that something that you see that for us, I think we've thought that emotion was an innately human trait, right? And so if we can model emotion in a artificial system, how, how do you think one will be able to do that? And two, what will be some of the consequences of that? So I think a lot of things that we think are the purview of humanity um, have been shipped away over time, right? Um we, if we think we're special, we're different from the other animal kingdom, I think a lot of the research is coming to bear that shows that we're not that different or that unique in a lot of ways. We thought we're the only species that uses tools. We figured out pretty quickly that crows know how to use tools, that many individuals, with, I mean, I'm sorry, not individuals, but many animals um, are able to use different types of um, objects within their environment and manipulate those objects to either get food or do something else with them. So we're learning pretty quickly that a lot of these artificial systems um, are able to create things very differently, right? Um, we thought that, um, and a lot of these systems have been trained on ImageNet and other types of images, um, pretty large image databases. Um, and we thought that they're not able to generate something new or something different, or they're not gonna be creative. And we're learning fairly quickly that a lot of these systems can be creative, or what we seem to categorize as creative. Again, there's you know conversation as far as you know, is this unique? Is this different? Is this original? Is this different from human thought and human creativity? But we're seeing a lot of these systems come up with what I consider pretty creative stuff. 
um, you know, in my narrow definition as far as creativity. And I think we're going to see much more of that. I don't think that this is the purview of just humanity alone. And as I mentioned before, if we're replicating systems in our image, in a way, I think the next step is human emotion. I think that's sort of like the last frontier. And there's a lot of work that's been happening at Boston Robotics and a few other places where um, they're training robots. And we see this interaction between, uh, we'll see a greater intersection between robotics as well as artificial intelligence systems and the combination between those two. So I think we're going to approximate human emotion, you know, I, I think within my lifetime, you know, hopefully I get to live long enough to see it. But um, and the way that would happen is that uh, with these robotic systems, right, you're going to create um, sort of replication of the five senses, you know, smell, touch, um, hearing, vision. And we see that a lot of these systems are really good at vision right now. So a lot of the vision recognition has been, uh, is pretty quite advanced. There's a lot of interesting research in olfactory research, uh, along with identification of smells and work around AI around that. And I've posted on that, which I think is fascinating. Same thing with um, hearing sort of auditory types of systems um, and then touch and smell. Um, each of these systems are being developed as sensors are becoming much more sophisticated, much more portable. And a lot of these robotic systems are being retrofitted with these um, sensory system along with AI based applications that kind of control that. And through, you know, sort of living within a 3D environment and interacting with that, this additional sensory data that gets incorporated into the model. Um, and over time, we could see that these systems are going to be able to live in a three-dimensional world and interact with that three-dimensional environment. Um, and same thing with facial recognition. I think, as I mentioned before, Empatic and a few other companies are doing some really interesting research where the visual systems are able to intuit fairly quickly based on a large scale of data over time, appropriate interaction with you know humans. So we're going to have similar to humanoids type of um, applications out there for a variety of uses. I think once we get to the point of having, you know, the AI systems in robotics and expressing more emotion or replicating human emotion, do you think this will have a profound impact on healthcare in the fact that, you know, we think of healthcare professionals needing to have a lot of empathy if they can have these systems that can show that empathy is, is this then when we start to see like a flood of robotics and big implications from AI in the healthcare space, or when is that kind of tipping point do you see? I mean, it's here now, actually. Um, Japan has done actually is a forefront, a lot of this research and they're using uh, robots for elder care. Mm -hmm. um, kind of filling that void um, in a lot of ways. So we see this and we're going to see much more of that. So I think they're kind of the pioneers in this using robotics to support individuals in different types of healthcare facility, elderly individuals to function, or even be that psychosocial support that, you know, otherwise, you know, loneliness is worse than smoking. Um, mm -hmm. So even having any type of um, interaction is better than no interaction. And we've seen that individuals are fallible. We kind of get attached to objects, even inanimate objects, very differently. So having an, I mean, an inanimate object that becomes animate in a way, right? These systems are becoming much more animate, and we think of, you know, old time animatronics. Um, we're able to interact and kind of develop that anthropomorphic transference that we've never really had before. And in a way, we assume that these systems are similar because they're built in our image. They're similar to us. So therefore there is that relationship. And there's, I mean, there is a diatribe of movies out there. Um, one movie that comes to an example is like her, where um, the primary character falls in love with a system or like a chatbot. I believe it's based on Cookie and AI, which was developed, I believe in 2015, almost 18 years ago, a long time ago. But so you see that type of, um, uh, interesting interaction between human and machine uh, project uh, being projected or created in an artificial setting, obviously in a movie or um, other types of scenarios. But if we're seeing those types of scenarios, then it's, you know, kind of movies, a fiction becomes reality, that is sort of what's to come in the future, which I think is going to be fascinating. 
Yeah, I think it's going to be a really exciting time to live in. And when you mentioned that we get attached to inanimate objects, I was thinking about like when the pet rock became a thing or yeah. even like Chia pets, you know, the and tamagotchis. things like, My daughter yes. loved the tamagotchis where you dad the tamagotchi and had to go buy a whole bunch of tamagotchis. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, and those were things that, you know, couldn't even do what we've seen tested today with like figure one and some of the different robotics out there, which I think is going to be a really exciting time to live in. I'm curious, you know, you also have um, you a background in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. I'm really curious of just, is there any connection you see between there in terms of AI, and you slightly mentioned previously how maybe AI will help us understand ourselves a little bit better too. Um, just given your diverse background, how do you see these fields potentially merging or if at all? I mean, I think when um, OpenAI kind of released the initial version of ChatGPT, individuals were actually using that application and conversing with that application in a way where they're asking pretty sensitive questions, right? I'm not feeling well today. I'm tired. I'm depressed. Um, in a way, they're, you know, and sort of asking advice. And what I found out is that it's easier to talk about sensitive to topics with an inanimate object, or in this case, an artificial type of application, um, similar to a chatbot, more than a human being. I think that disconnect almost um, the uncanny valley of it's not a person, but it's person-like. Um, it can give me advice without being exposed. And I could talk about something very sensitive that I wouldn't be comfortable talking to a therapist because I would think that they're going to judge me. There might be potential bias. I just don't feel comfortable to share this information in a setting. It makes me much more vulnerable. I'd rather just talk to a, a void or some other system where I could share this and be really honest and candid. So we've seen quite a lot of development. Um, And I think this is going to be an area that's going to develop further, sort of chatbots and other types of application, specifically for mental health. And actually, a few colleagues of mine at NYU and others are working on this area right now to really think about what types of applications can we design that can provide the psychosocial support, um, obviously for you know serious issues like suicidality and many other critical um, needs you definitely want to refer to a licensed therapist or a licensed substance abuse counselor somebody who's been trained to deal with that our systems are not sophisticated enough but the systems can provide guidance um, regarding what's out there in the public domain as far as best practice so uh, recently I was asking chat GPT give me a meal uh, I mean a meal plan and a weight loss plan and you know just to be better and uh, you know and it came up with a really great plan in a way we're seeing much more of those types of asks. I remember when, when WebMD came where it had more of a static kind of Mm -hmm. list of information and individuals could interact. And I was there you know, because of a hypochondriac that I was, I was there all the time asking like, oh my God, is this, what type of condition is this? And kind of reading ad nauseum. And now those, I mean, the, those words are coming live from the page in an interaction type of pattern. And we're gonna see those interactions, not just type in a text format, but more almost like a visual uh, exchange of information the way we're doing now. So with digital avatars and others are interacting directly with the end user. Yeah, I think it's really exciting. Just also given the fact that a lot of mental health services are not accessible to a lot of people or they don't have access to the funding to be able to pay for them. And so one just thinking of the scale and accessibility that individuals may get from this. But yeah, you make such a great point in regards to just like instant trust. I know if you talk with a therapist long enough and realize, okay, they're not judging me and it takes yeah. time to build this trust. But there is this matter of like, I have probably shared more things with ChatGPT than I probably, you know, would would go back and go, oh, I told her that and it, it would be surprised even myself. And so I think it's important to look at those positives from it as well. We've talked a lot about just the ways that AI is currently revolutionizing healthcare and mental health. What do you see though, you know, with any tool, there's always good and bad, right? What do you see as some of the potential downsides that we could run into from using this technology more and more from either a health or mental health perspective? I mean, the pitfalls, I think um, one of the issues is the a priori, a priori trust 
with these systems that you're putting in a lot of like really sensitive information out there about your health or mental health or other type of condition with that a priori trust. So you're putting it out there into this application. You're asking these sensitive questions, right? And you don't know how that information is going to be used or where it goes. Who's going to look at it or what's going to happen to that information. Um, I think that is one of the issues that I worry about, sort of the data bleed across, um, especially uh, protect our health information, protect our identifiable information, the data bleed within these systems and how those, you know, reliance on corporations and others to be the, uh, the stewards of our data. I think that's going to, you know, that's definitely a challenge. Another thing is that, um, you know, from like a mental health perspective, um, so World Health Organization is doing some really interesting things with um, like soul machines and one of the companies that created almost digital avatars. I think you talked about, you know, kind of supporting um, and providing these resources to low risk in other communities, especially, you know, post pandemic, everybody you know, has experienced some sort of mental distress over time, mm -hmm. kind of meeting that need. Um, I think some of the implementations of the technologies that haven't been fully baked, you know, and kind of addressing really sensitive topics um, is also an issue. I would have liked, and, and my researchers, are, a researcher at heart, I'm still, I'm still a researcher. So for me, is that if you're going to do uh, a randomized controlled trial, if you're going to put, you know, a medication out there for public consumption, then it has to go through I mean, maybe not 14 years of research, but at least a pipeline of evidence that this is definitely, you know, there's a, a beneficence as far as this medicine, um, there's going to be no sound uh, adverse side effects for individuals that they're going to use this uh, application. So I see these tools the same way that if we're going to put these applications out into public domain, that the same types of rigorous research is being done, that there's going to be no secondary or tertiary harms to individuals using these, you know, in a way I think of them as additional products. Um, but it's really important for us to think about each of those components. Um, and I don't think a lot of the regulations have, have caught up with any of this. Yeah, I'm curious, you know, within the U.S., where our data, I feel like, is most protected is when it comes to, like, healthcare data because of HIPAA laws and regulations. If I freely give my kind of health data to one of these systems, is is that like I freely gave it away so it's open or you know, at this time are like the companies responsible for like, oh, we shouldn't have seen that. Don't give it to us. We got to delete that. Do we have anything, any laws or kind of ways to handle those types of situations today? The, the, it, the, it's really interesting um, is that the technology develops way faster than the rules and regulations. I think the guardrails, the train has been running for a while. I think the rules and regulations are going to try to catch up, but the train is even speeding more to like quantum science. So, <laughs> however, even though that's happening, I think we need guidance, rules and regulations around these applications, these tools, um, because in a way you're trying to reduce risk. So yes, maybe you're putting your public information out there. Um, are you fully aware of how that information might be used? You might not be. Nobody's using reading, sitting there and reading um, all of the EULAs or user agreements that companies put, all the 20 page six point font that they're getting smaller and I'm having a hard time reading it. Um, nobody sits there and reads all of that, right? That's how Netflix was able to add individuals to their shows recently because people didn't read the EULAs. They ended up on a Netflix show. And they're like, wait, how did I end up on a Netflix show? Well, it, it was in there. They can use your likeness and image, but nobody sits there and reads all of that. It was, you know, I don't know if it was Dark Mirror or one of those shows, but no one's going to sit there and read all of that information, right? It's impossible for us, especially if you're being bombarded with information all day long, that your capacity to consume, read, judge, and assess is becoming even more limited. So I think for us is the companies that are using our information has to be responsible for their information. And sometimes you might not, I mean, you might think you're giving your information freely, but you're in a way, um, there's not, nothing, nothing is ever free. Um, you're giving your time, but um, I, I just worry that 
this um, laser fair approach as far as sharing information and really not thinking about what are the ramifications downstream and upstream as far as how your information will be used. And the trust is really being put into these large companies like OpenAI or Microsoft or and, and not saying that these companies are nefarious or anything like that or Google or I don't know, I'll pick on Elon Musk or any of, you know, <laughs> um, is that we're putting too much trust in this corporation to do the right thing. So I think this is where the government and other regulatory bodies have to step in and put those guidelines to make sure that um, things are done accordingly because self-interest is self-interest. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and you're not able to see what might potentially happen. So um, these applications have to be for all, and therefore the regulations have to protect all of us and not just a few of us. Yeah, it's a very interesting time because, you know, for some time we've been, technology has just been outpacing human development, right? Let alone the laws and regulations that come with it. And I think we also have a time too where there's a gap between what the regulators know and, and what the technology is today. Is there any way that we as builders in this space can do a better job of sharing some of the concerns or more importantly, helping educate those who are in a position to make a decision in terms of regulation? I mean, I think you're doing the right thing. You're educating individuals um, because asking questions, I think that's really, really important. I was listening to a podcast recently. I, I remember it was a podcast or something else. Just and um, one of the presenters was saying is that just by the act of asking questions, you kind of elicit. Oh, I, I remember what it was. I was listening to the radio and they were talking about um, ethical use of resources, especially within fisheries. Right. And one of the individuals was saying that, you know, I want to be much more socially conscious. I don't want to destroy the environment. I want to make sure that um, if I'm consuming something that has been, you know, especially a fish that has been ethically caught. Um, and how do I do that? And then the response of um, the presenter was basically ask questions. If you go to a restaurant, ask them, how did this fish, how was this fish sourced? Mm -hmm. um, and if they have no clue, then ask more questions. Um, and I think the whole idea of being inquisitive and asking questions. So using that example, kind of applying it to the technology side is that okay, yes, I've given my data, what happens to that information, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for example, today I had a conversation with another researcher where she's like, well, we have all of these patient data and uh, radiologic data that gets used and that gets uploaded. Uh, the university uses that to, you know, to train their algorithmic systems to identify potential cancer. I'm like, great, did the individual downstream that individual person that got screened provide that consent for their information to be used upstream to test or train these radiological systems. My, my, I, I don't think that pipeline, I mean, I've seen consent processes. Mm -hmm. um, again, remember the example with EULA, did, does everybody read a consent in a hospital, all the 10, 20 pages they give you? Uh, chances are you're just signing off and not reading everything. So you're not really thinking about the ramification of your personal healthcare information and how will that be used by systems. And another thing that I worry about is that each of these systems have incentives, right? They're using this to develop a radiological tool. Are you going to benefit from that? Mm -hmm. Are you going to get a discount for your healthcare? <laughs> is the healthcare going to get cheaper? And healthcare is not getting cheaper. It's get, just getting no. more expensive. We just have these cool tools. Um, so I worry that, um, you know, some of those uh, regulations need to step in to make sure that the consent process, how information gets used, and then from the consumer side to be really aware of, you know, when you're giving your information to Fitbit or I'm not picking on that, but many other companies out there, um, they're, they're going to be stewards of your information. They're going to do the right thing, but also there has to be um, similar to California or GDPR human loop in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love your suggestions in terms of asking questions because when, when you ask that question, who you ask may also go, oh, I never even thought of that as well. And sometimes yeah. just by merely asking the question, you convert somebody to another side of 
being curious or waking up to asking more questions. So it's just such a collaborative way to either start to spread that education and make a change and also not come off as, you know, being aggressive or, yeah. you know, having a problem with something. So I think that's something that we can all do a little bit more of and do a better job is asking those really good questions. You've mentioned research a couple times and how you're a researcher at heart, still do research. I am curious if you had, you know, an unlimited budget and all the time in the world, what research would you like to be doing or be doing now? If that was an option. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have a limited budget, number one. <laughs> we usually have to apply for grant applications. Um, it's usually the science is a team sport. Um, I, I think for us is really kind of looking at the ramifications of these um, applications and doing a little bit more research on that, looking at the efficacy of these applications, um, and then really thinking about, so bringing an interdisciplinary team, and I'm kind of involved right now with a group, really thinking about the ethical questions of these systems in our environment and who do they benefit um, in the end. Um, and kind of tackling the disproportionality issues and a few other issues. If I had a lot of you know money, I would definitely look at that part, as well as um, when these systems are being implemented, that there is no negative consequences. And we've seen a lot of these systems. Um, I always think have great intentions. I don't always think about the unintended consequences. So really taking task of what would be those potential um, unintended consequences and how do you mitigate that? So research around that would also be super helpful, I think. Yeah, definitely on the interdisciplinary and it's a team sport. I'm such a fan of like the collective intelligence. I, yeah. I know there, I there research there is research on collective intelligence. It is a real thing. It <laughs> is. It makes such a difference. Real thing. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. As we get close to wrapping up here today, if you could give people beginning their career in you know the age of AI any advice, what would that be? Ask a lot of questions. Um, somebody, I was in a um, university meeting and a lot of the students were asking, you know, how did you get here? I failed often. Uh, <laughs> as Angela Duckworth says, you got to have some grades, you know, and just move forward. But I think, you know, being curious, learning, the field is moving so fast. Are you going to learn everything? Probably not. As I mentioned, this is a team sport. But the more that you ask questions, the more that you learn, um, the greater generalist you are, you are able to understand how things are moving and to, to kind of look at those connections. And again, you, you know, rely on the experts that are out there, but educate yourself enough as a lay person to understand what these terms mean and really understand how this will impact you. Because in the end, just like with internet, it's impacting us. And this is the next wave. I know we're in the hyper phase of AI, but sooner or later, it's going to be integrated into many applications. Uh, and some of that is already being integrated without us even knowing it. So I think awareness is also a really key component. Yes, that's Fantastic advice. It's something we say here on the Data Bytes podcast all the time, you know, stay curious and keep learning. And I love what you added on to also be okay with failure. We all, that's really how we grow, right? And learn from our mistakes. So yeah. thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us, sharing your work and coming, taking the time to come on the podcast today. Oh, such a ple pleasure, Sadie. Thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation and we'll hopefully we'll have future conversations and, you know, learn and be curious. Yes, many more. And to all of our listeners, a big thank you for listening. Remember to stay curious and keep learning. And we'll catch you next time on the Data Bytes podcast. Bye, everybody. If you are enjoying the conversations you are hearing today, we encourage you to continue to be a part of the conversation and join a community of like-minded, extraordinary women. With our free community membership, you're stepping into a realm where learning, networking, and growth are at the heart and soul of what we do. Connect with Women in Data's global community and network with our chapters all for free. But why stop there? Upgrade your membership with a special offer for Databytes listeners by getting $20 off a pro membership in which you'll receive access to over 300 classes, leadership training, and exclusive events. If you're interested in mentorship and networking, we've got you. 
from monthly thought leadership webinars to exclusive networking events and a diverse on-demand mentorship program, the connections you'll make here are boundless. Join us and be part of a vibrant network. Dive into our book clubs, growth groups, and industry-focused gatherings. Women in Data is not just a community. It's a movement, a place where innovators, change makers, and leaders come together to shape the future. Visit womenindata.org to join or use the special discount code in the show notes. Together, let's drive change one data byte at a time.